Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in the boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired man and followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Congregation may be seated. A grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So we are still in the season of Epiphany. An epiphany is all about us getting epiphanies about who Jesus is and what that realization means for us in the year ahead. So we read story after story about people who are epiphed in the New Testament by Jesus and their lives are changed and a vision is set for them for their life ahead. And last week was all about what the vision epiphany had set aside, or rather, what the vision epiphany set us last week was about what epiphany said to us as church it was all about how we are all in this epiphany business together and what we were doing as a church but this week epiphany is personal it's about you and your work about who will be your power supply energizing your work as a follower of Jesus in your life in the year ahead. And now when I say your work, I'm not saying that anyone here needs to rethink their jobs, unless, of course, that's something you want to hear. But I'm not saying it um, as a way of making you think what you're currently doing isn't working and you should do something different. That's not what happens in our gospel text, and it's not necessarily what needs to happen in your life. The disciples in our text today actually have the right jobs. They have the right jobs already. They are fishermen. And that job as fishermen has given them a certain skill set that Jesus needs them to have. And so that's why Jesus doesn't say to Simon and Andrew, follow me and learn a new skill set. Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Do you notice that difference? He doesn't change their job. They already have the right tools. They just need to be powered by a different purpose. And Jesus doesn't change their occupation in life. He just adds a vocation. And he does that by powering their purpose with himself. With himself. I will make you fishermen. From here on out, you won't be controlling your nets, your purpose, your movements, your action. I will power you as fishermen. Jesus is lining up their skill sets with his power, and when he does that, it creates a vocation for them. Lining up skill sets with power. Quick story about that. Actually, it's a quick story about my genealogy trip to Sweden last August. So I was going to to see our ancestral farm and to meet my ancestral family. So I wanted to look nice. So I needed to take my trusty Beach Waver 3000 curling iron. Okay. And I remember 15 years ago when we were stationed at Spangdalem Air Base in Germany, that I can't just plug in my 110-volt American appliance into two 20-volt European outlets. So, make a few phone calls, and I borrow an adapter from one of you folks, and I pack it alongside my curling iron. I get to Sweden. It's beautiful. It's amazing. We're having the best time, my best friend Beth and I, and the morning comes, 
when I'm going to travel to my ancestral farm and meet my kinfolk. So I bust out my curling iron and adapter. I plug it in, and I start curling my hair. And I've got, I've got a chunk in there. And I'm so excited about the day that I'm not really paying attention to the mirror. I'm just yakking at my friend Beth. Oh, we're going to do these great things. And it's going to be so fun. And all of a sudden, I smell burning hair. And I look in the mirror, and my hair is smoking. And before I can unwrap it from the curling iron, a whole chunk comes right off in the iron. Complete and utter de devastation, folks. I mean, it doesn't get worse than this. There is a beautiful little strand, not little, it was about that big, chunk of hair in my curling iron. So yeah, I lived in Germany, and uh, I should have remembered <laughs> that an adapter is not enough to prevent all 220 volts to course through my curling iron and fry off my hair. So if you notice that my hair has been a little lopsided since August, now you know why. But this is a long way of saying that I had the right tool, but the wrong power supply. And when those two things don't line up, bad things happen. But when they do line up, when you have the right tools and you have the right power supply, great things happen. Just look at how nice my hair is today. <laughs> That is the essence of Christian vocation. When Lutherans talk about vocation, when Christians talk about vocation, we are not talking about jobs. Jobs are what make you tired by the end of the day. Vocations are what get you out of bed in the morning. A vocation is the work we do for the kingdom of God where we use the unique spiritual gifts that were given to each one of us. Now we have to choose our jobs, right? We have to choose our work. Why? Because we have to earn an income, we have to put food on the table, but God chooses our vocation. It's how God gets the work done that God needs to get done in the world right now. Martin Luther said, and I'm going to quote him a bunch today, sorry, he said, God is hidden in our vocation. He said that vocations are the masks of God. On the surface, we see our mother, or our doctor, or a teacher, or our waitress, or our pastor, or our mailman. But beneath the surface, beneath the appearance, God is ministering to us through them. That is what we believe. And so in, our, in that way, rather, our ordinary labors are charged with purpose, no matter how humble they are. And for the Christian, when we are not leaning into our vocation, there is dissonance, there is turbulence, there is chaos in and around us. And that is what we saw in that Old Testament reading with Jonah. We didn't actually see it because we get to the point where the whale has already spit Jonah out. But quick Bible quiz, what was Jonah's occupation? a prophet. So that means he hears God's voice. But lots of people in those days could hear God's voice. His vocation was to use that voice to save people's lives, to stop them from sinning. And he didn't like Ninevites. So what did he do? He jumped on the closest ship going the furthest distance from Nineveh. And when he does, the seas roar, and chaos is overwhelming, and the Ninevites are stuck in sin and death. And it wasn't until Jonah aligns his vocation with God's power source and word that he gets to Nineveh. That is the way it can be for us when we are not doing the work of serving God by loving our neighbor with whatever means we've been given to do it. And the truth is, it is hard work. And that's why we don't always want to pick up on our vocations in the morning. Because 
Vocation is all about somebody else. Martin Luther said that vocation begins each day with us dying to ourselves and rising to neighbor. And uh, uh, anytime you're inspired by someone say, well, you got to die a little bit, sounds like hard work to me. It's hard to live into our vocations because it's all about serving outside ourselves. But I want to suggest to you that it is also hard for another reason. And for that, we need to read what happens next in our gospel lesson. And Chrissy, if you'll put this up there. So remember in our gospel lesson that Jesus calls Simon and Andrew to be fishers of men. And the first place he takes them is back to Simon's mother-in-law's house. Poor guy. <laughs> and it says, while Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they took him about her, told him about her at once, he came and took her by the hand, this is Jesus, and lifted her up. Then the fever left her and she began to serve them. So Jesus is showing them what their vocation is, right? And right after Jesus helps a neighbor, what happens? That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed by demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Turns out, the disciples are going to be using their fish filleting skill set to slay demons. And when you slay one demon, what happens? They all show up. More people carrying demons show up because they have heard that this is a place that slays demons. That is why it is hard to live into these vocations. More is always asked of those who give. And it is literal demon slaying. When we are engaged in our vocations, we are slaying demons for people. And slaying demons, I hear, is hard. But honestly, what, what could be cooler? What does your faith require of you? Oh, nothing, just demon slaying. It is empowering work, hard as it is. Our vocation is the space between our baptism and eternal life where we get to choose sides in the ongoing battle between God and demons. When we lean into loving neighbor, living out our vocation within our daily occupations, we are banishing the demons of darkness with the light of Christ. When you are caregiving for your sick wife, you are slaying demons around her. When you are telling a co-worker as you're restocking shelves with them that God wants more for them than alcoholism, you are slaying his demons. When you are teaching your children to be merciful like D Jesus, you are slaying demons. It is hard work. And what does it look like? One more story about hair. So years ago, I worked at West Haven Elementary in Belleville as a reading tutor in my former life. And one day, the Title I reading teacher, Miss Mayer, was sick, so they asked if I could sub in her little room. So I do, and, you know, I see a couple kids. I go through their lesson, and about third or fourth kid is Ashley. And Ashley walks in, and she's a little first grader. And her clothes were too small, and her shoes were worn thin, and she had dirty fingernails, and her hair was uncombed and disheveled. She was the sort of child that you knew was coming from a home that was overwhelmed for whatever reason. But those weren't things that I could do anything about. It wasn't the reason I was there. It wasn't my job. So I just did the lesson with her. And when we were done, Ashley says to me, what about the barrettes? And I said, what, what do you mean, the barrettes? And she said, Miss Mayer has barrettes for me. And I said, I'm sorry, kiddo, she's not here today. And I shoo her along. 
And so the next day, Miss Mayer comes back, and I tell her all about the day, and I said, oh, you know what, though? Oh. Ashley was in here, and she was talking about barrettes. Do you know what she was talking about? And she goes to the top drawer on her desk, and she pulls out this little purse. And it doesn't just have barrettes in it. It has detangler spray and dry shampoo, uh, little ponytail holders, and a comb. And she said, I do her hair at the end of every lesson. Miss Mayer was a demon slayer for that little girl. That is Christian vocation. That is someone who has the right tools and the right power source energizing them. And so we too can lean in, brothers and sisters, to our vocations this year. And it will bring light to dark places. And it will keep demons at bay. And though it might bring more demons to your door than you prefer, know that you can come to this place and be re-energized by our Lord Jesus who meets us at the table and who will send us out again to choose each and every day to do battle with and for him. Thanks be to God. Amen.